Good evening. Here's what's happening. The report on the space shuttle disaster is now in President Reagan's hands, and the public will get a look at it on Monday. Tonight, CNN's John Holloman reports some hard-fought battles among members of the investigative commission that wrote the report. One member was harshly critical of NASA, and therein lies the tale that John Holloman unfolds now from Washington. Lord. Commission member Richard Feynman charged that NASA had virtually ignored the principles of physics and good scientific practice in designing, testing, and building the space shuttle. The Nobel Prize winning physicist wrote a section of the final report known as Chapter F. Commission sources say Chairman William Rogers read the chapter and was furious. He called Feynman to Washington Wednesday and urged him to tone down his criticism of NASA because Chapter F threatened to destroy public confidence in the space agency. Feynman returned to his home in California and began his rewrite, but then changed his mind. Sources close to the scientists say he felt his ethics were being compromised. He sent a message to Rogers threatening to resign from the commission and demanding his name be taken off the final report if his chapter was not included in its entirety. After a day of tense negotiation, Feynman agreed to stay on the commission and sign the final document. But. The result of all this is that President Reagan will not read Dr. Feynman's criticism this weekend at Camp David. His chapter will be printed and released as part of the lengthy appendix to the report. At the White House, a senior administration official says there's still no consensus on a fourth shuttle orbiter, but CNN has learned the president does support the plan to replace Challenger. The senior official says if the fourth orbiter is approved, the president will ask Congress to appropriate money to build it rather than take money from current NASA programs. John Holloman, CNN, Washington. The members one promises to be somewhat more harsh in its evaluation of the space agency than the general commission report being made public today. Sources close to the panel say the Nobel physicist Richard Feynman had concluded that the chances of a catastrophic shuttle accident were far greater than NASA had predicted before the Challenger disaster did happen. Dr. Feynman, you may remember, was one of the more skeptical members of the Rogers Commission. He had asked some of the tougher questions of the NASA witnesses. In fact, he had threatened not to sign the final report out today because it was, he thought, not tough enough. Later, however, Professor Feynman reached an agreement with William Rogers on the report's language, and he signed the report being made public today. Good morning. With us now for a newsmaker interview is a key member of the Presidential Commission. He is Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist from the California Institute of Technology. Welcome, sir. Was this an accident that did not have to happen? Yes, it, yes, it was. It was uh, an accident that had many, many warnings that there was something wrong and that it might sooner or later go off. And uh, the warnings were disregarded disregarded out of incompetence, out of a faulty system, out of bad judgment, out of, for what reason? I had some difficulty with that. I kind of imagine that something like a child that runs in the, in the road and the parent is very upset and says it's very dangerous. And the child comes back and says, but nothing happened. And he runs out in the road again several times and the parent keeps saying it's dangerous and nothing happens. If the child's view that nothing happened is a cl clue that there was nothing going to happen, then that's going to be an accident. You could hear bre brakes squealing a couple of times. That's leakage and the gas is going through the rings and so forth. But again and again, I saw in looking through this statements, this new flight is within our database, which just means nothing happened before. It's about the same as we did before. So it can't be unsafe because it was OK last time. And that is a kind of childish attitude that uh, the mother corresponding to the engineers here right. and the management corresponding to the children. Now, that's the way I look at it, and I don't know what you would say. Sooner or later the child gets run over. Is it an accident? No, it's not an accident. And yet, your commission, and uh, we just heard uh, Chairman Rogers, your chairman say we should, we're not here to blame anybody. Why not? Why not? Why is somebody not blamed? I don't know how to assign blame and whether it does any good. The question is, how do we educate the child? Uh, the question is, you could say you blame the child for being a little foolish, but it's very difficult. I tried to figure out why they have this, this attitude and why they weren't paying attention. I've tried various theories and I really don't know the ultimate cause. What's your theory? Well, one of the 
there's two theories. Okay. People, right. A lot of people say to me that there's some kind of, a, of an idea in management that the incompetence reaches its level or whatever. But I had another idea, which I don't know whether it's right, and that is that in the beginning, all kinds of exaggerations were made about what this thing can do. It can fly 60 flights, it will only cost so much, it'll be recoverable, and th there'll be no real problems. The engineers at the bottom must probably scream, this is my imagination, they're screaming up, no, no, it can't be this way, it can't be this way. We can only go 10 flights, we haven't got enough equipment to train that many crews a year, so forth and so on. And the people at the top who are talking to Congress don't want to hear this. And so they discourage information for moving up. You see, it was just after they were so successful with Apollo. And in that case, they were doing a project which was just a little bit harder than they could do, just a little bit harder, so they could do it. Mm -hmm. And they would solve one problem. No, this is my imagine. I'm imagine. I wasn't okay. there. Yeah. Somebody would say, we can, how are we going to make a spacesuit? And finally, they got a solution to that. They get excited and tell the others. The fellows are working on some other problem, gets a solution to his problem. And there's a lot of intercommunication because there's excitement and motivation. But when the Which is not, the, not always necessarily a bad thing, right? No, not at all. It's, mm -hmm. it's what makes it go, and that's yep. why it worked okay with the Apollo. But then when they had this other project, which is, so to speak, impossible from an engineering point of view, it's unrealistic, they don't want to hear what happens. It just goes up, and each level in a bureaucracy kind of understands what it's supposed to do. Keep it from the other guys. They don't have to hear it. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it because it would be uncomfortable to be going and saying we're going to do 60 flights a year when just that morning they were told that it's impossible. That's the theory. Now, I, okay. as you I know, you. I'm a professor of physics and not of management and human relations, and so it's very likely not right, but you asked me for my theory. At the, one of the hearings, in fact, I think it was the first public hearing, you took a glass of water and dropped a piece of uh, a rubber seal into a glass of water right. and made the demonstration that cold weather is not necessarily a good thing for a rubber seal. Have you proven, was your theory in the glass been proven correct? Do you think that's really what caused this seal to go bad? It was too cold? That's one of the, one of the possibilities. Uh, certainly was one of the possibilities. It's definite that when the temperature is reduced on the seals, the way they were being used in that device, in the shuttle, uh, the temperature has a very bad effect. What caused a certain amount of trouble is that O-ring seals, as used autom in automobiles and so on, are in a position uh, where the space is constant, that the, the space that they have to doesn't move, and therefore resilience is not vital, and the temperature is not, it's not sensitive to temperature. So everybody thought seals are not sensitive to temperature. But the way this seal was being used, the spacing between the rings and so on would vibrate as the thing blew up with the pressure and would move, and the ring has to follow that. And when it's cold, it can't follow that. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely a possible contributor. But as we looked into this thing, we found so many other problems associated with the seal design, that there was a kind of putty that could have holes blown into it. There was problems about whether there were all other kinds of difficulties. I got you. So, so it could that be a combination. So we couldn't thing. decide exactly what it was, and I won't be able to say that it was solely the temperature, but that certainly was a possibility. How do you feel about the job your commission did, generally? I think we did a pretty good job. It turned out to be easier in some respects than we could have imagined. It was I easy wonder, to find out what happened. I, uh, but I was curious, why did Chairman Rogers uh, say at the White House today that it would turn out to be more difficult than he thought it was going to be? What was he talking about? Well, maybe we had different expectations. Uh, it's strange because at the very beginning of this uh, commission meetings, I remember Mr. Rogers saying, well, of course, we may never find out what may the accident occur. And that turned out, that's what I meant was easy. I see. You know what happened. And we you know what happened. Now, the, what was difficult, and I think maybe he's referring to this, was the discovery of these weaknesses inside of NASA and their attitudes, mm -hmm. this kind of illogic about safety and so forth, which was so extensive from an organization which had such a reputation in the country that it was hard for us to find it out in a sort of emotional way as to have to come around and say that the Wizard of Oz, which everybody respects, has nothing behind it. The New York Times... Uh, almost nothing. Almost, okay. The New York Times reported this morning that you had some, you had a clash with uh, Chairman Rogers over an appendix and other, and also uh, Elizabeth Brackett in her report referred to that passage. What's that all about? Well, that's terribly exaggerated. Uh, it got into the news somehow. I, 
no control of news sure. or no experience with. Uh, at one point, I had written a document which was meant for the other commissioners. I had investigated a number of things, and I was just sending them a note telling them what I'd found. And it wasn't written for publication. Uh, then there was a discussion. The various commissioner members who looked at it said it was pretty good, and we ought to just put it in the report report but it wasn't it was written in a personal style it wasn't proper for the rest of the report so since we're going to have appendices which have a lot of detail they said let's put it in appendix and I'm very happy with that but because we had this ha habit of modifying and, and trying to keep things short by cutting things down that were repetitious and there were some things in there that were also in the report it started to modify this and I looked at it and I thought it was nice the way I wrote it you know so I asked that it be put in the, since it was in the appendix and we weren't so worried about space, let's leave it in the appendix without any modification at all. And they said, okay, but look at this sentence isn't written very well. And I agreed definitely. It was only a suggestion that I changed the sentence. And I changed it not because I lost any ideas. I had said the same idea in a careful and much more con quiet way earlier on in a paragraph and there was no need to repeat it. It improved the sentence. It's just typographical. I also made another change where I found a sentence had bad grammar. Nobody knows about that one. There's no stink about that one. So there's, there no, stink no, here. there's no stink here at no, all? No, sir. There's no problem. It so was as just far as you're concerned, you're, this was a unanimous report from the commission? And, uh, you, yes, sir. You, you didn't yes, go sir. away with any scars, and neither no, did sir. the Chairman Rodney. No. All right. Dr. Fama, don't go away. We'll be back. Thank, well, thank you. you. Charlene? NASA declared